welcome. We are so excited for you to be here for our very first webinar. My name is Kendra Spires, and I am on the technical sales team here at Edvent from the Canadian side of things. Today, we are actually going to do a webinar on our H2S analyzers. So if you have any questions at all, please put that in the little question box in the chat, and it will send it to uh, our sales team that is actually there, ready, waiting to answer your questions. We will also be asking, answering questions at the end of the presentation as well. So if you have any, please ask, ask away. Today, we are going to be talking about our 330 and 331 H2S analyzers. Um, I will do a brief, very brief explanation of our different analyzers for your, your measurement solutions. And then Al is going to come up and he's going to talk about our H2S properties, the hardware and major components and assembly of the H2S analyzers, as well as the display menus, um, the two different analyzers we have up here, as well as servicing the actual analyzers. So, we have our M series, the M60 H2 or O2 oxygen analyzer. Uh, the M70 is our hydro water. I was going to say H2S, guys. Our water analyzer. <laughs> our M90 is our carbon dioxide analyzer. And then we also have what we're talking about today, our 330 and our 331 H2S analyzers. They can also add total sulfur to that. So they use the exact same analyzer, but we have the ability to actually measure total sulfur as well. Uh, we have our sulfur sentry, which is our portable H2S analyzer, and our gas chromatographs. So they come in class 1 div 1 and class 1 div 2 for those as well. And then also reps, Michelle. So we have the ability to help you with any of your water content, dew point, hydrocarbon dew point measurement um, applications. So if you have any questions about those, please feel free to reach out. We also have a tunable filter spectrometer, so our TFS as well as Endon prides itself on working with our customers and working with our users to create the right sample conditioning system for their solutions. We will look at the exact application you're wanting to put it in and design our entire sample conditioning system around that app. Along with all of that, we also have buildings, enclosures, and probe assemblies. So we are literally a one-stop shop for your entire solution and application. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Al and he's going to take it away. Thank you very much, Kendra. Appreciate the introduction. I'm Al Willett, yeah, Technical Services for North, Northern Alberta, BC. And uh, we're coming at you here from Envent Engineering's head office in Northeast Calgary. So before I get into the nuts and bolts of these devices, which I'm going to talk briefly about, it's mostly about service, I need to introduce you to some hydrogen sulfide for those of you that may not be familiar with it. H2S is in about one-third of all natural gas that's produced in Alberta, and it is colorless, heavier than air, and extremely toxic. Therefore, we need to monitor for it. So hence, we have our H2S analyzer series here. So they're configurable with software called ICE, Integrated Configuration Environment. And what that really means is, is we have a software package. The intention is just to plug it into any one of NVENT's devices, and you have the same software package. It has the same look, same menu systems, etc. And so we can measure a very wide range of H2S concentrations. Uh, the analyzer itself will measure specific concentrations, but we can go beyond what the analyzer is capable of based on a conditioning, sample, sample conditioning system that we create. And they're also capable of total sulfur measurement. So total sulfur measurement, basically what we're doing is converting all our sulfurs into H2S. And then it gets measured in our H2S analyzers as H2S. So with our systems, our basic systems, with our basic sample conditioning systems, we have filtration, regulation, and flow control. So filtration, then we regulate at 15 PSI. And then our flow control, we set it at 2 centimeters on these tubes, which is approximately 100 cc's per minute. And then inside the device, we'll have our humidifier. So what we do is we do all the filtration regulation, flow control, and then we enter into our analyzer with a sample system or with a pressure controlled and flow controlled stream. And then we enter into our humidifier. The reason we have a humidifier is we need to have humidified gas going to the tape because we need proper absorption. I'll get into that in a little bit. So we also have this 
the 330 has this very similar sample system. So we've got filtration, regulation, flow control, and then inside here is our humidifier inside that enclosure. So when we flow into our humidifier, once again, we want humidified sample getting to the tape. Two main reasons. First one is, is you want consistent repeatable readings. So in order to do that, you need good absorption on the tape, basically a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction takes place when you have H2S in contact with lead acetate tape, turns it brown. And in order to get good absorption, you need humidified sample. You could still stain it with a dry sample, but you do not get consistent and repeatable readings, nor do you get uh, staining very quickly. So your staining will take place slower. So we go through our humidifier, through a permeation tube, then we enter into our sample chamber. And in the sample chamber, what we're doing is we are monitoring the stain. Now, a lot of folks think that the tape is constantly in motion. It is not. It's only in motion between analyses. So the tape advances and stops. Then our flow of our sample is going past the tape in a certain area through our aperture. And it stains the tape in a small area. The, anal the analyzer is looking for this rate of change. How quickly is my tape turning brown? And that's where the electronics kicks in. So the sensor mounted on the sample chamber has an LED which shines light on the tape and it also has the sensor or the, the detector that picks up the amount of reflected light off the tape. So if you have white tape, your maximum amount of light is reflected back to the detector. If you have a dark stain, you have less light reflected back, hence the, the detection method and how it calculates the total H2S concentration. Now, one thing we have to do with these analyzers is we need to balance them. Now, when I say balancing, they're very site-specific. So we will balance an analyzer based on your requirements for, you know, your typical H2S measurement concentration, so where you're normally going to be measuring. And another thing is analysis length. We need to be looking to see if your analysis length is appropriate for your application. And in doing so, we can modify it. The, the analyzer itself, so that we get a good analysis length and a decent colored stain, not too light, not too dark, so that we can measure anywhere from parts per billion up to 500 parts per million. So how we do that in part of the balancing is inside the sample chamber, we can limit the exposure to the tape or we can actually increase the exposure to the tape. So what we do is we use what's called an aperture. So this particular aperture, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but basically there's no opening, there's no hole in it, but it fits, it's very thin, and it fits inside the sample chamber, and what it actually does is as the stream is going by, it deflects the sample, pushes it onto the tape so we can get our, our 50 ppb parts per billion H2S up to our one part per million H2S. So that's, we call that a wedge, but it's a uh, ppb style. Then we have our... Well, what you can actually do is you can have a quarter inch, which is no aperture at all, so full exposure to the tape, as opposed to deflecting more onto it. Full exposure to the tape will give you somewhere around one part to 16 parts per million H2S. Now, if you're above 16 parts per million, you have to start adding apertures, so you need to limit the amount of exposure to the tape. So this one here, that's a 1 16th aperture. It's a small slit. So basically, that sits in between the tape and the sample going past. So it limits the amount of, of uh, sample or H2S that gets to the tape and exposed to the tape. So now we can start measuring higher and higher concentrations with the same tape, same flow, same pressure, everything based on limiting the amount that we expose to the tape. We can continue and you can see the chart. There's a chart there that explains, uh, you know, pretty accurately what kind of ranges you can measure with what aperture. Of course, that's based on your flows and pressures as well. So, but this one is going to be very hard for you to see. You know, between the 100 and 500 ppm, we call this a laser dot. I don't know if you're going to actually even be able to see that, but that is basically a pin. Not the head of the pin, but the point of the pin. Very, very small. So in the higher concentrations, as you can imagine, as your tape is sitting here and your flow is running past that, we're allowing very little amount of sample or H2S being exposed to your tape. So that's how we balance the analyzer. And just really quickly, you see that chemical composition there. So basically our hydrogen sulfide, or our sample with our H2S in it, plus the lead acetate tape yields lead sulfide, which is the brown, and acetic acid. So 
<clears throat> out, exiting out, so now we've talked about bringing the sample in, humidifying it, running it through the sample. Now we're talking about getting it out, getting it out of the vent, getting it out of the analyzer and outside. So what we have is an eductor. An eductor, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it very well, but it's mounted on here. There's one mounted over here. And all our analyzers come with this eductor. Basically what it is, is it's a venturi. So we put this block at the end because our, our sample, our, our spent sample or sample exiting the sample chamber is vented outside. And we do not recommend ever putting any resistance on that vent or you're going to affect the pressures at the sample chamber. And I will get into that. So what we do is we bring our sample in, but in, on the inside you can see in the chart you got your you can either use instrument air or sweet gas. It basically has a jet and the jet is pushing into an opening. It's basically a T cut into this and it creates a vacuum. And the vacuum that's created is going to pull in air. You can see on the back of that fitting there's a hole there. So that's just pulling in atmospheric air as well as in the bottom pulling in atmospheric air, represented by the blue arrows in the diagram. So what happens is, is we're, we're constantly blowing this out, bringing in inst or, uh, atmospheric air, bringing our sample through. It's not really sucking the sample through the analyzer, it's just creating a, a, a decent amount of uh, uh, eliminating back pressure, to be honest, is what it's really doing. So the reason for this it's, um, there's multiple reasons why we use that, but the main reason is, is to get good stability inside your sample chamber. You want good pressure and good flow, consistent. And what can happen is, is if you have wind blowing on the vent of your analyzer, you're going to build up a little bit of back pressure. And if we didn't have these openings and pulling air in, what's going to happen is you're going to create back pressure in your sample chamber. Not only are you not going to be accurate, you're going to not be very repeatable at all. Another reason for this and benefit to this aperture, or sorry, the uh, eductor, is when you're uh, in colder climates, if you were just venting your humidified gas, as we're humidifying it, you just vent that outside, what's going to happen in cold climates is it's simply just going to freeze off on you eventually. So now with this, we have the advantage of possibly blowing clean or dry instrument air or dry um, gas, with, which is sweet. And we're also bringing in tons of atmospheric air from inside the building, blowing it out, basically diluting our, our humidified sample so that you don't have that freeze off. And another advantage is we're in increasing the amount of flow out the vent so much that insects have a hard time getting themselves into the vent and building nests, which has occurred in the past. And one other advantage or way that you can do it downstream of the adductor, as you can see on the diagram, downstream of the adductor, we call that a candy cane. So basically that was designed by an vent engineer. What it does is it eliminates, it eliminates the pressure going straight onto the, onto the uh, vent header, vent end. So this is where we get, ex get excited. This is the exciting part. We're going to service the end vent H2S analyzer. This is a quick overview of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be quickly uh, using the local display, so I'll describe that a little bit, a uh, very limited amount. We're going to change the lead acetate tape, show you a little trick there that I've learned over the years that I find very beneficial. We're going to clean the sample chamber, so we're actually going to pull this out, pull the sensor off, clean that sample chamber to show you how simple it really is. And then we're going to do a leak test on the sample chamber, because if you put this thing back together and you have a leak, you're going to have problems. And then we're going to leak test that humidifier, show you a quick trick in order to test how to uh, how to check for leaks on the humidifier and, uh, and then so what I'll do right now I'll, I will just go right into the display thank you I will go right into the display the display is identical on both devices this one in the class one div one is behind a glass so obviously you're not going to be able to push the buttons unless you remove the glass but as opposed to removing the glass all engine analyzers come with a magnet and the, the buttons on the display, there's four buttons, top, bottom, left, right. They're activated because they have a read switch right beside them, so a magnet will activate them. So what I've always done uh, is teach that you put the magnet on the glass in, a, in one of the corners, and then just swipe it past the button. So every time you swipe past, it's going to activate that button. So any button that you want, as opposed to tapping that glass with the magnet. But Outside of that, what you can do is you can simply just either pull the glass off, touch the button, or push the buttons with your fingers. 
and activate each one. So the top button is your bypass. It is configured this way. It can be configured for other uh, scenarios to be used for other reasons like acknowledging alarms, etc. But they come out of the factory. Standard ones have it as the bypass. So when you press the button, your bypass comes on and your analyzer is ready to go. Really quick about the bypass. The bypass does two things. First thing is with your analog loops going out. When you hit that bypass, your analog loop is going to go down to 2 milliamps as opposed to 4 milliamps being no H2S or 0 milliamps representative of a broken wire. So the 2 milliamps would be an indication to your PLC DCS that you're in operations mode or service mode. Um, the next uh, buttons are the menu and set button at the bottom. It serves two purposes. The first purpose is a menu. So you, every time you hit that button, it's going to scroll through your menu system. And the menu system is a scrolling menu system. So if you get to the bottom, it just starts back up at the top again. It goes around in a circle. Um, second purpose for that menu, excuse me, menu set button is a set. So if you scroll through here to, for example, you want to acknowledge, do a system acknowledge, what you do is you press the right hand button and now it does a system act. Now if I scroll to a live value, for example, my gain, and we're not going to get into gain, but gain is how we calibrate the analyzer, so you need to change the gain value when you're calibrating. You'll see a little pencil on the side, that means you can edit that. You use your left and right arrows, you move to the number or digit that you want to change, and then you use your set button and change the value of that number. And how that works is it's scrolling as well. So it starts at 1, 2, 3, up to 9, back to 0 again, just goes around in the circle. So that's pretty much it for the local display. Uh, we're going to get into servicing this analyzer right now. We'll service this one. Uh, there's a couple things, tools that you may need. Uh, I recommend a Phillips screwdriver. What I typically will use is just a small blade. You don't want a big screwdriver because most parts on here don't need a large screwdriver when you're servicing. So keep it to a reasonable size so that you're not over torquing any of the screws. And then you may, should have, there's methods around not having a vacuum or a pressure gauge, but this is actually something Envent can provide you. It's a mini helix. It has inches of water column on it. And it's got two fittings on the back, one's positive, one's negative. So the negative being vacuum, positive being pressure. So you can measure both with this device. Very good troubleshooting tool, and we'll run through that in a little bit. But another thing I, I recommend is getting some tubing. So you can see the, the model numbers. Those are swedge lock rubber tubing um, model numbers. This is LT4-6, and there's others on, this, on the screen like you can see. I'm going to be using a few of those to help me troubleshoot. Very advantageous having those on hand. So now we're going to actually get into this. You walk up to your analyzer in the field. It's sitting there running, running on stream gas. What you're going to do, the first thing you do before you, before you even uh, consider pulling this apart, is you hit that bypass. You put it in bypass. Of course, that's going to, that's going to uh, put your 4 milliamp down to 2 milliamps, but it also puts your discretes. All your alarm points, they actually go to a non-alarm state, and that's exactly what you want. So anything you do here isn't going to affect you in a negative way or affect your process, closed valves like on pipeline systems, etc. One thing I want to note is when you hit that bypass, it does not impact your Modbus. Your Modbus signals still continue to go out. The only way really around that is you can set this bypass button to turn on uh, a Modbus uh, uh, coil which will send an indication to your DCS PLC to tell you that you are in a service mode. Therefore, it does its magic on that end. So it's very important that before you service this, you know that you're not going to cause any negative impact to your system. Because what we're actually going to do, part of this, we're going to probably see elevated levels of H2S. False, but elevated. And that could create negative impact on your system. So we... We uh, close the isolation valve, so we come up to our system, which would be flowing, close the isolation valve, and hit our bypass. While you hit the bypass, close the isolation valve, allow your pressure to bleed down to zero. It will, eventually, and when, when it's back down to zero, now, because you could be dealing with H2S, sometimes larger concentrations, you want to make sure that your system is stable and safe. Then what I would do is I would disassemble, pull the, vent, or the sweep tubing off, unthread the filter, and make sure you check your filter. Those things are often ignored. So my recommendation is every time you service, you're checking your filter. 
Now you can extend it or decrease the amount that you check it based on your findings. So one thing I do, and I often hear guys say they never do, it's not important. It really, to me, it's important because I want to know how this analyzer, what the condition it's in before I start versus when I'm finished pulling it apart and putting it back together because there's something I could mess up. So what I do is I would run my cal gas into my cal right, calibration inlet, swing my three-way valve, allow my cal gas to get in there, let it run four or five times, something like that. I want to, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly stable, but I kind of want an idea of how this thing is responding. I want to know what it's doing, what response it has based or compared to my calibration gas. So then I would turn off my calibration gas after I do my calibration check. It's not a calibration, it's just a check. So I call that my as file. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to record a couple of my analyzer configuration or, or uh, results. Basically, the, the most important one is your gain. That's what it's calibrated with. That's the value you want to uh, make sure that, that uh, if you have something to compare to at the end, you've got this number because you're going to be running cal gas at the end. And the next thing I want to know is what is it? It basically tells me the condition of the sensor. I want my my sensor millivolts at zero. And that tells me what my sensor is reading on white tape, that beginning of every analysis. So that to me is critical, very important stuff to know. So you know the condition of the analyzer when you put it back in service. So right now I'm gonna run into a quick procedure with one cool trick I think you'll like on changing the lead acetate tape. Of course, lead being somewhat toxic, let's put our gloves on. So I'm going to show you a quick procedure. You can actually see on the display, you can see the route that we would take. So for this example, because I already have new tape on there, I don't have any spent tape on this demo model, but what I would do, this tape reel here would be full or near full. This one would be empty or near empty. So what I would do, first thing I do, is I rip my tape at the top and at the bottom, leaving, I don't know, five, six inches uh, of tape on the top and on the bottom, sitting there in my sample chamber with my, my trigger slide pushing against it, holding it in place. So, dispose of your used tape. This is not to be thrown in the garbage. This has lead in it and it needs to be disposed of properly. So now I've got this analyzer sitting here with this piece of tape in here. What I would do is I would have this off and I would put my new tape on there. First thing to consider is how are you putting your tape on there? What direction is it rolling? Well, on these single sensor devices, you're going to run it off the top, down to the right, and then feed it around this wheel and through your sample chamber. We have also a dual sensor, and the dual sensor, we'll get into that in a second, rolls off the tape the other way. I just want to mention that now. So what this little trick is that I do is I put my tape around the wheel, and all I do is I push it against the tape that's already in there. I just put a little bit of uh, pressure there so I have friction. I simply pull this tape through, and there goes my tape. It comes right through the sample chamber. <clears throat> and I'm going to explain, interesting that this fell off on me, but I'm going to explain why we wrote the tape over the top of this, uh, the wheel. And the main reason is, well, there's two main reasons. The first one is, is that this tape, this wheel, as I've just demonstrated, is very freewheeling. It has very little friction on it. So what can happen is, if your tape is running off the left side, your tape can actually get low enough, really, with very little movement of this tape, and it'll be in the way of the door. You close your door on that, drive away. You won't know for a little while. You'll be kilometers down the road before you realize your analyzer is now not working. So we run it this way. The second reason why we run it this way is, uh, in many cases, there's leaks in the building, or could it possibly be a leak inside the analyzer, hence we're going to do leak checks, but you're going to have atmospheric H2S, and that atmospheric H2S will stain this unused tape. So what happens is, is you get some staining on this tape, pull it through here, the advantage to the end vent analyzer is we do a zero just at the beginning of every analysis. So if you have a little bit of a stain on your tape that's being seen by the optics, it automatically compensates for that by zeroing on that stain. And then it measures the rate of change, the amount that is getting dark over a period of time from that point on. So um, if you have your tape routed this way, you allow way more tape to be exposed to the atmosphere uh, before it gets to that sample chamber than in this route, routing it over the top, 
you've only got about six inches of exposed tape because otherwise it's laying up against the other tape here. So then you've pulled your tape through and you want to attach it to your tape up reel. Always fold the tape in half on the end so that it does not slip out of the groove. Place it in the groove on your take up reel. And then what I do at this point, because I want to be very confident that this tape isn't going to come out, I scroll down to motor run and I hit my right arrow and I, I'm not sure you can hear it. But the tape is rolling, it's advancing, it's pulling the tape through and I would stand there and keep doing motor runs until I have overlap so that you know that that's not going to slip out the minute you leave. Okay, so that's quick, quick rundown, a little trick on how to change the tape. I'll just put this back together. Um, and I mentioned earlier that, that uh, you can route on the dual sensor, route the tape the other way. Our dual sensor, our dual sensor H2S analyzer slash could be a H2S total sulfur. What it does is it actually measures two streams simultaneously on one tape. And how it does it is we have a sensor block looking at one side of the tape, one looking at the other side of the tape simultaneously. So you can see in this humidifier, we have two streams. We have two humidified streams coming through the humidifier. We would have two streams, so we would have another uh, flow meter right here, two separate streams running through two streams here, two sensor blocks out the vent. And the advantage is kind of taken away in ways. We, we can't rotate this way on that based on spacing. So what we do is we have an extra wheel here. We roll it the other way using that wheel so that the tape doesn't get dropped and uh, compressed in the door when you close the door. But you still have a slight disadvantage of having the tape staining. You, you have to run it off the top left of the tape reel. So the next thing we do is we add acetic acid to our humidifier. I'm going to remove my gloves. So the humidifier has acetic acid in it, and we do not recommend using standard vinegar, which is 5% acetic acid. The problem with vinegar is it's meant to be consumed by humans, so they sweeten it. Sweetening isn't good in an H2S analyzer or in our industry because it attracts insects, so you do not want to attract any insects to the device. So we, we provide acetic acid with no sweeteners in it, and what you will do, I will use this demo model, what you do is you can fill the humidifier to the line if you choose to, but you can just make sure that you have some in there. It's evaporating constantly, so you want to make sure it's above a certain level. If you're not going to visit for quite a while, you can still go above the level. Just make sure you don't submerge your permeation tube or your fittings in the acetic acid. Okay, so now what we're going to do is start to disassemble this, and we are going to clean the sample chamber. So the sample chamber is attached, or the sensor block is attached to the sample chamber, so we're going to pull them off as one unit. So first thing you do, <clears throat> just start disassembling at any point. I pull the screws out first. And what you do is you can disconnect the power at any time. You can do it under power, connecting or disconnecting. It makes no difference. So I've disconnected power. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull my my vent tubing off, let me step aside, pull my vent tubing off, pull my supply tubing off, then what I have to do, because the, the uh, trigger slide is actually holding it in place, it's pushing against it, so I've got to pull back on that, now I can remove my sensor and my sample chamber. So this here is my sample chamber with my sensor on the block, this is the groove that the tape runs in, there's the little exposure area, the quarter inch exposure area that you see on the tape. You'll see that, that uh, quarter inch staining that takes place on the tape. So next thing I do, I remove the sensor block. Taking the sensor block, all I'm doing is I'm loosening, not removing, but I'm loosening these hold down brackets. Spin those out of the way, simply pick up my sample or my sensor block and set it aside for reinstallation later once I clean my sample chamber. Now one thing to note is this sensor block never sees, it's never exposed to the sample. It has a window and a gasket that keeps it from being exposed to the sample. So it should be clean, you should have no issues there. Now typically what you're going to see in typical dry gas applications, you're going to see a nice clean window and gasket with the exception most likely of some dust because the lead acetate tape creates dust as it's running and moving past the aperture. So 
All I do is I hold down my window in my gasket and I use canned air, simply blow it on there in each of the openings and that's it. Just got to clean the dust out. So now I don't have to disassemble this thing every time. Every time you disassemble it and you pull your aperture out and your window and gasket and wipe the dust off of it, you're scratching it. So that's what I do. I just hold that window and gasket or it's going to go flying on you and, and uh, blow out the dust. Now this window and the gasket, as you can see, it sits in a groove on here. Never use silicone or anything related. You should just have a window and gasket. If you can't fix a leak with it, change your window and your gasket. So install it in the groove. Take your sensor block. Do not slide your sensor block on there. What you need to do is place it on because if you knock your window off, you're definitely going to have leakage. So I, I push, I, I place it on there, push down on that, swing my hold down tabs and just snug them down. You're realistically just trying to, you don't want to torque it down too much. You're just trying to make sure there's a seal between that window and the gasket so you're not leaking any H2S or sample out into the atmosphere. So that's it. That's cleaning. You, you, you can remove the window. If you, if you have an aperture, and I didn't mention it, but this one does not have an aperture in it. And uh, the aperture uh, is just basically held on with uh, silicone. We put it in there inside the sample chamber and... Uh, I'm not sure I actually explained that. Um, did I explain the... the yeah. I did? Okay. So the um, this one doesn't have one in it, which is very... Uh, oh, yeah, I remember mentioning it now. It's very common to not have it on the lower end. So if you did have a aperture in there, they're held down by silicone, what I do is I take like a, a soft object. Do not use a screwdriver. I'll use maybe a pen, but actually I have... Uh, um, Q-tips in my repair kit, and I'll just push on it from this side, push until it lets go. Clean off the old silicone, clean your aperture, put it all back together with RTV silicone, and you're good to go. Now, we've cleaned our sample chamber, so we're going to just simply install it, just do the reverse. So what I do is I hold my compression head back, place my sample chamber in place, my compression head's going to hold it, put my screws back in place. And once again, don't use too large of a screwdriver. You don't need to torque this down. You just need to make it snug so it holds into place. And the critical part about putting this back in is you want to make sure that your tape is sitting in that groove. You don't want it folded because oftentimes if you push your compression head against the tape and it's not fitting perfectly inside that groove, as it advances, it can walk its way out, and you don't want that. So... Our tape is in place, our sample chamber is back installed, so now I can plug it in, so you can plug that connector back in, and then connect your vent side and your supply side. So now our sample chamber has been removed, cleaned, and checked. So now what we're going to do is, uh, I forgot to do a sample. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to remove this. I forgot one step. I want to show you guys a quick method to do a leaf test on the sample chamber. My mistake. So having removed this, putting it back together, what's critical is to know that you don't have a leak. And your leak is typically going to occur at the uh, window in the gasket, which I described already. So what I'm going to do, and this is something I do, I carry a piece of tubing in my pocket in my coveralls because I want to be the only one to put my lips on it. So pre-installation check, what I do is I've got three openings basically, inlet, outlet, and then the aperture. So what I do is I plug the aperture and I plug the inlet and then I blow. If I feel pretty good resistance, I know it's sealed. Some people will actually create a vacuum. Not always recommended, but you can do it if you choose. So that is a, that is a uh, quick leak test. This one is not leaking in my opinion, so I'll put it back in. But if you don't have the tubing to do the leak check, that way what you do is you can do a couple leak checks with or without a gauge. You can do that once you have it back installed. So just give me a second here, I'll install this back into place. Once again, making sure I'm not torquing down too tight and also that tape making sure the tape is sitting nicely in that groove. 
I'm going to leave my vent side off because that's a part of the check. So what you can do with your pressure gauge, what you can do with your pressure gauge is, I got that on vacuum, I'll put it on pressure. What you can do with your pressure gauge is just check the pressure that's going through your sample chamber. So I'm connecting my gauge up to the vent side. Sorry, wrong tubing. Check it on the vent side. So what I'm looking for is some pressure. Two to three inches of water column is just fine. So what you're going to do is you're going to turn your sample on. You're going to have it set for 15. This is set for two, which is very standard on these. And you can see my pressure is going way up. I'm climbing up to five. So I don't have a leak. I'm very confident that I don't have a leak. So if I had a leak, I wouldn't see any pressure because it would be going up the path of least resistance. So actually, I'm going to leave that connected because it acts like a blockage. But another method you can use is you can turn it on if you don't have a gauge, and you simply pinch the tubing for the, uh, for the vent side of your, your sample chamber. Now what you're going to do is you're going to sit and you're going to hold this for about 30 seconds or more because what you're trying to accomplish is you're staining your tape. You want the back pressure to push against your compression head and push it away. And if it pushes that compression head away a little bit and your leakage is out your aperture, what happens is you get flaring. So your stain isn't going to be nice and uniform. It's going to be flared off to the sides. And that's actually what you want in this test. You want that flaring because then you know it's not leaking somewhere else. The only place it should leak is past that compression head if you block your vent. Hence, very important to have an eductor in place so your vent isn't blocked, creating that leak and a bad stain in the end. So, taking this gauge off now, connecting my vent back up. The next step we do, so we're confident that we don't have a leak. If you've got a leak in here, just pull your, your window and gasket off, so your sensor off your window and gasket, and try spinning it 180 degrees. Try that. Keep trying it until you get it to not leak. Otherwise, you're going to have to replace your window and your gasket. Okay, so now we have an eductor vacuum test. So we've played around with the sample chamber, and now this eductor, <clears throat> remember I described this eductor, it's basically a jet blowing air creating a vacuum because it's a, it's a venturi. The way we check to see that this thing actually is creating vacuum is what I do, so this would be your sample coming in, this is your air or sweet gas and your vent. Since there's these two holes here, I plug one. So I plug the top hole, and I've shown you that, but that top hole and that fitting, I plug that where it's pulling in air, and then what I'll do is I'll take, Teflon tape is great, I've got a little piece of Teflon tape here. I will bring my Teflon tape up to that bottom hole to make sure it gets sucked in and not blown out. If it gets blown out, what it means is your, your, your jet isn't shooting straight in creating a venturi. You're not creating a vacuum. You can use anything, a little bit of uh, lead acetate tape, it'll hold it there. And that, then you know you have vacuum. The key is, is to have vacuum. If you don't have any vacuum, then now it's time to probably disassemble this and clean it. So what we can do is simply pull your fittings out. And this is a sample of the jet. You can actually see the hole in it. It's all pre-configured and pre-engineered so that it creates a venturi. No problem. You usually don't have issues with these newer models, but there are some very early models Instead of that type of a jet, what it had is it had kind of a handmade jet, had a little piece of tubing in there. And if that tubing got bent and it wasn't shooting down the center of your vent, what's going to happen is, is you are going to have pressure as opposed to or a vacuum. In fact, if you don't have vacuum, you're going to have gas in your vent leaking out inside your building. You do not want that. So yeah, you can do your cleaning. And the only real reason why you would ever have to clean it would be is because it does create a vacuum, if your air is extremely dusty, dirty, etc., you may get a little bit of blockage or plugging in there. So you're checking for vacuum. If you've got vacuum, you're good to go. So the next thing we want to check, we haven't pulled this apart, but part of your maintenance is checking that humidifier. So if you have a humidifier leak, oftentimes you, there's a humidifier leak, you've got some pre-staining on your, on your uh, new tape, and that's probably the first thing I ever go to if I've got pre-staining on here, if I assume it's not in the atmosphere outside, it's inside this box when the door is closed, it's probably my humidifier. Really quick check for the humidifier. You've got your 15 PSI, you've got flow on your flow meter. All you do is you go to the downstream tubing, so the, the outlet of the humidifier tubing, I fold it in half, pinch it, and hold it. 
what should happen if I don't have a humidifier leak or a leak between the flow meter and this where I'm pinching it, my flow is going to drop to zero, and there you saw it drop to zero. It can take a period of time to drop to zero because what's happening is, is you're pressurizing the whole system to your regulator set pressure, and then it drops to zero, meaning it's not there's nothing flowing anywhere. If you've got any flow on there and you can't stop the flow completely, you have a leak. One other method that I do in order to find which fittings are leaking, if I have one, I would submerge my fittings in my acetic acid and you can tell where the bubbles are coming from. So you can tell where your leak is very specifically. So that's your humidifier leak check. So now I've done all my checks. I've changed my tape. I've added acetic acid and you can add acetic acid very simply. Uh, get it to the line or above. My recommendation should never be below. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a motor run. What I want to ensure is that I have white tape. So what I do is I scroll till I get to motor run, hit my right arrow, closes the contacts, it advances tape, you can see the wheel moving, it advances the tape so it guarantees I have white tape there. Then what I'll do is I'll run my calibration gas, I'm not going to go through that. Um, so I'm just allowing it to finish. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run a calibration to ensure everything is good as far as my calibration. This is the point I would calibrate. I wouldn't just do a cal check unless no adjustments are necessary. And then what I want to do is I want to scroll through here and look at my millivolts at zero. And this one right now is sitting at 1,035 millivolts. It's between my, my 1,100 and my 900 millivolt reading. So I know my sensor is good. Everything looks good on the analyzer. Then I'd run my cal gas make sure that my calibration is accurate. Um, then, and we're not going to go through the calibration right now because we don't have time. Plus, that's for our next presentation or coming, coming to you soon enough. We will run through another video presentation online. So I return this thing back to surface sim service simply by Taking my cal gas off, I have to swing my three-way calibration valve. So they'll always have a three-way valve on here unless some very early models. Swing it back to stream gas, allow my stream gas to flow through. What I would do is I would wait a few runs to make sure that everything is good. Then, as long as I'm not in an alarm state, if I am, I will go and acknowledge any alarms that are latching. I will then, once I'm confident it's running on stream gas, no alarms, the reading looks normal. I will then turn off my bypass. Now everything's activated. Your 420s are live again. Your discretes are live again. And uh, I just want to also mention that uh, that uh, that we do have some upcoming sessions coming, and we don't exactly know what they are yet. Uh, please complete the survey that you will see and continue to provide feedback and ask questions. We will allow our our chat line to remain open. Um, also, we will be pre-recording this at some point and playing it in the future probably on our YouTube channel, so watch for us there.